Okay, so now we will have uh, a, um, a talk by Nathaniel Wong uh, called Introduction to Julia, Creating Packages for Earth Observational Work. Nathaniel is a five-year uh, PhD candidate at Harvard University studying tropical climate using a range of observations, reanalysis, and modeling tools. He has developed a few Julia packages, such as georegions.jl and nasaprecipitation.jl, to help with his work that requires retrieval and use of Earth observational data sets. He also used Julia to analyze model output from WRF and uh, Sam. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, no, I'm fine. I think I think I'm fine. All right. So, um, okay. afternoon, everybody. Um, just a question: um, Who here is touching Julia for the first time? Okay. And who here um, has not? Those of you who have used Julia before for the past um, longer than. Uh, longer than the day, how many of you have tried creating packet? How many of you have not tried creating packages before? How many of you have no experience in creating packages? Yeah, in Julia, no experience in creating packages in Julia. Okay, so yeah, this talk is meant to help people understand the basics of package creation in Julia. Um, I will be going through a few more basic concepts in Julia as well, such as environment and project management in Julia, so that, um, and how to install, basically how to install packages, how to update packages, how to uh, basically do what you need to do. So basically, for example, just now, uh, Julia, Julio was uh, introducing the uh, geostats a geo tables package, but how do you install the geo tables package in Julia? Because a lot of these packages, most of the packages that we will be talking about over the next five, four to five days are not actually packages that come with Julia. They're not inbuilt into Julia. You have to add them, you have to add them well, they are registered as part of the Julia ecosystem, but you need to install them. You need to select them and install them. The, it doesn't come. It doesn't come with the down with the Julia that you downloaded onto your computer. So um, this presentation also is mostly geared towards Linux and Mac OS users um, because of the heavy usage of terminal. For Windows users, I recommend the usage of Windows terminal or at least being able to run or at least if you have an alternative that's able to run Julia on the command line. So if you like, so like being able to use command line features or terminal features to go into folders, to create folders. For example, uh, let's see. Uh, okay. So for example, like a terminal window like this, where you can go into, where you can go into, uh, pro where you can go into different folders, where you can, Run Julia, for example. Um, if you have um, if you have a Mac or Linux, this should more or less this should more or less be relatively easy for you. If you're on Windows, is there anyone here who has uh, anyone here who has been using Julia for a while who is using it on Windows? Yeah. So um, might I ask you guys for help? In this case, if of like to help later, if I'm when I'm doing terminal sessions to help with uh, running Julia on terminal, for example, if that help, if yeah, if okay, thank you. So um, got that out of the way. Okay, so um, and pop, and it's also because I also think it's good. Uh, well, I wouldn't say necessarily best practice, but from my experience. If you don't know how to use Julia from terminal, um, there's some stuff, or if you're not comfortable with using Julia on terminal, there's, uh, it can get it can get a bit tricky when you're trying to manage your package environments per se. Like I'm used, or at least for me, I'm used to starting up Julia in my project environments and then running them in the respective uh, files, for example. So it's good to know how to use terminal when you're running Julia. It's actually good to know terminal when you're running Python, for example, as well at the same time. And some additional, one more additional thing. Um, later, if we have time, because this, I know my lecture is two hours, but there's a lot to cover. 
uh, if we get to this part, the notebooks that I will be using can be found on the GitHub repository here. I will flash the link later as well um, when we get to that part again. But uh, it's just online and if you want to look at the notebooks after the lecture, you can also download them after the lecture and uh, fiddle around with the notebooks as well. Yeah. So the aim of this lecture is that we have to understand that the Julia, the Julia community compared to the Python community is relatively small. So we don't necessarily have the wide extensive community that Python has when it comes to package development. Um, a lot of packages are therefore developed by individuals like uh, Alex who developed NC data sets, like Julio who developed uh, the the geo the Julia Earth uh, community and for me like uh I developed geo regions and NASA precipitation etc cetera, etc cetera. a lot of us are doing this as individuals that are uh trying to uh that are trying to help the wider Julia community for for Earth observation but the fact is that because we're all individuals our attention span and the amount of effort that we can that we can dedicate towards developing packages is limited and we can't do we can't develop packages for everybody because we are developing packages for ourselves as well so the thing is much of the development of julia in the earth sciences uh, requires individuals like you who are also just newly starting out in Julia to also come in and help and with package development for your own specific needs as well um, to help mature the uh, Julia ecosystem in earth sciences, in earth observations, etc, etc. Like all these packages that uh, are here that we're talking about today, tomorrow, few days in the future, they're all, in, they're all developed by individuals who started out Maybe a few years ago, I personally started using Julia in 2020 and uh, there's still a lot that I need to learn as well. But I'm here to try and share some of the uh, pitfalls that I went through in developing packages so that you won't go through those pitfalls again. Yeah. So to develop a package, you need to understand the basics of Julia environments and package management and also package development in Julia. So the outline of today's lecture is going to be first understanding and managing the package ecosystem. And then we're going through creating packages in Julia. Um, and then if we have got a bit of time, I will also be going through the package, uh, my package georegions.jl, both as an example of a package that has been developed over the past three years, because I've been working on georegions for the past three years, and also some Earth observation packages, uh, not packages, Earth observation application usages of georegions.jl. And um, if and then if we have time, if you uh, if there's time in the next two hours, assuming we don't run out of time, um, we can talk more about developing packages for your own use cases as well. Yeah, so um, this, this is a more detailed outline. Maybe I'll just skip it for now. But um, the thing that I want to get to is the Julia package ecosystem. So what is, so the Julia package ecosystem and the concept of Julia environments. So basically when we're talking about an environment, it is, in my opinion, a bit similar when we're talking about Conda environments, except that the Julia package environment um, is a lot is a lot more developed or not is a lot more streamlined and a lot more seamless than the con than using Conda to manage your package environment. So when using Conda to download, so think about when using Conda and a Conda to download a package, and then Conda when you ask it to install this package, it will also install all the dependencies for you, etc., etc., etc. Uh, Julia has an inbuilt package manager that allows you to do all that without needing, and in my opinion, it is much better than Conda. So uh, because of the way packages are built and packages are registered on the registry, um, the package ecosystem in Julia is a lot, is a lot better able to handle uh, conflicts in dependencies, and it, it's a lot better in telling you when something is not compatible with another thing, for example. So that's, uh, that's what a Julia environment is. So a Julia environment is defined by two things. 
One is the uh, one is the project, and one is the manifest. So in any project, if you see on the screen here, any any project here that you see is defined has a um, project.toml and a manifest.toml. So if I go into, so this is, let me escape this. Uh, escape, escape. Okay, so if I go, so basically I'm in my projects folder and I have a lot of different projects, for example. If I go in, uh, all these projects are Julia projects, by the way. So if I go into any of these uh, folders, for example, and I list, you will see, you will see uh, that there is a project.toml and um, manifest.toml. So what these projects and manifest.toml do is that they define what packages are inside your projects, for example. So for example, if I look at what, uh, if I look at what the project.toml is, the project.toml, the dependence that uh, all, the, all these are the list of packages that I am currently using in this particular project. And if I go to another project, uh, let's go to Sumatra Squalls and let's look at this project list again. You will see that the project list is slightly different. So for each of these, so for each of these uh, projects, you for each of these projects that I I have, I have a project and I have a manifest, um, and I when I install and when you are when you are hand, when you are using these projects, for example, in each of these projects you should have a separate environment for each of these projects where you will install all these dependencies independent. So all, when if you install. Uh, package in project A, you will not, you, it is independent for installing the same package in project B, for example. So if you can have, so if you have two different folders with two different projects, installing your package in one project will not affect the project in, you will not affect other projects that are independent, for example. Um, does that make sense? Is everybody following? Yeah. So that's the basics of, uh, that's the basics of, uh, what a project is, um, and for every project, you should create a different environment. Yeah. So just now I showed you the project project.toml contains your package list. It's always necessary. Uh, it also contains compatible. It also contains um, compatibility bounds of the packages. So if you see, so um, here you see compact. Compact means compatibility. So you can define the com the range of the. So for each package, it is possible to define what um, what uh, version of the packages you want in that project. So for example, if you want version five and not version four, because your project requires that you use version five, you can set the limit to be version five instead of version four. For example, um, and more information on what projects and manifests are can be found if you search. Um, if you go and search for package.jl, package.jl is basically the package manager. It's basically the package manager for Julia. It is inbuilt into Julia. Um, but the documentation there will provide you with a lot more information uh, that is necessary to understand the handling of. Uh, your environments inside, for example, in, in there, for example. Yeah. So going back, we've covered project.toml. Okay. And with your project, you can also define your project name, for example. So for example, the name that, that one is convection isotopes, the other one is NASA precipitation. That's the name of your project or your package, for example. Um, yeah, this is for compacts. You can specify you can specify the compatibility of the versions in your projects. Um, the second one is manifest. So basically, a project is necessary is necessary to define the packages in an environment. You will, if you want to share a project with someone, you at least need to share your project.toml with that person so that they can so that they when they when they compile the project. They will Julia will automatically download all the necessary packages for you. What a manifest does is that a manifest specifies what exactly the versions and the links of the packages are on your personal computer. 
So if you upload the manifest.toml and you give it to someone and they and you compile the project with a manifest.toml, uh, you will in they will in in actual essence, they will be installing exactly the same copy or the same versions of the packages that you are using on their computer. Uh, they basically the exact same versions that they the exact versions that they install on the computer will be the same as what you have installed on your computer when you uploaded your manifest to, or you gave your manifest to them. So a manifest is not strictly necessary. Uh, in order to share a package, in order to share a project with someone, but it is necessary if you want to share a project with someone and you want them to be able to reproduce the same results that you got on your computer. So, um, if you, and yeah, so that's the difference between a project and a manifest. You must always have a project, like I said. And if you don't, uh, if you, but if you don't have a manifest, when you compile the environment, when you compile the environment of your project or your package, Julia will automatically create the manifest for you. So your manif so manifests between different machines, different computers, even for the same project, can be quite di can be quite different depending on where you're where you're pulling your packages from, what versions you're pulling your packages from. So uh, let's see. Um, here. So when so when you down so for example if you go and if you download uh, joeregions.jl so this is uh, joeregions.jl you see that here uh, oh sorry I didn't I have to keep exiting the presentation I'm sorry um, okay so you see here that this is the package joeregions.jl if you enlarge the screen you see that when i when for a package when you create a package and when you allow it to github you don't create you don't upload the manifest as well you only upload the project so uh let's clone the pro so let's clone the project so we okay cd uh git clone this Uh, slow, 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 slow. Uh, okay, fast. <laughs> Sorry, it's taking a bit. Mm. Now mind, let's go to let let's uh let's basically go to georegions.jl and you see in oh it's not loaded. Mm. Damn. Uh is it done? Yes, it's done. Okay. Georegions.jl. You see here that you only have the project.toml. When you activate and you pre-compile and you pre-compile the environment. <sighs> All right, it's compiled. You see that you have created a manifest. So a manifest, so you can create a manifest on the spot through compilation of the environment. So only a project.toml is strictly necessary if you want to define an environment, if you want to define a package or a project. So um, yeah, that's what I showed you just now. So that's how that's how that's basically the upshot of what an environment is. An environment is basically uh, environments are basically project plus manifest. Uh, but the project is where you define is where is where the information of your packages is saved and manifest is what exactly those packages are. So we got a few activities uh, for those of you who are new to this. Now your turn to try and create an environment. So if uh, this we require the usage of terminal. So if um, anyone has okay, this requires the usage of terminal. 
So, um, so we could we we can go we can go through this step by step. So if you want, so basically the first step is that uh, just create a random uh, create a random folder in uh, where wherever. Um, okay, sorry. You create a random folder wherever. Test uh, folder, and you go into test folder, right? You go into test folder, and then you run Julia in this. Uh, you run Julia in this. Uh, in this folder. So, um, if when you run Julia in this, when you run Julia in this uh, folder. Sorry, you should also know that there's nothing inside this folder right now, right? Because I haven't defined anything in this folder. When you run Julia in this folder, and then you proceed to act. So basically, what happens is that um, this is what this is what you see when you just start up Julia. When you just start up Julia, and then you press the you you press in order to enter the package console in order to enter this version one point nine. What you have to do is you have to do this. You have to enter this part. You have to use do this command. Do this command. Uh, sorry. Do this command over here. This one here. Do the right bracket. The right square bracket. Press the right square bracket. You should be able to get into the package environment. Uh, has everybody reached that step? Okay, so and then after that you do activate activate dot activate so dot means current folder so activate the current folder you're activating a new project at the current folder this is what you're doing you activate dot activate space dot you activate the new project at this current folder and then add a package add a random package say you want to add geo tables add geo add geo tables. For example, and see what happens. You add your tables, and this is this should be what happens. So when you add something, and then it compiles some, and then it pre-compiles something, and it will install all these things, and it, and then it will store all the dependencies of your tables for you. So what you will see, okay, let's see how long it takes to compile. Okay, so Joe tables is the only package install, so Joe tables is the one and okay. So when you see status, status means that you are on, you are viewing all the packages that you have installed in the project. So you've only installed Joe tables in uh, this particular for this particular project in project.toml. So in project.toml, it only shows Joe tables version one point fourteen point three. For example, you go out. You go out. You go out of Julia. You exit Julia, and then you list ls everything that's in the folder. You see that Julia has automatically created a project. Uh, let's see, Julia has automatically created a project and a manifest for you. And then, if you look at the project, the project only contains one package, which is JoeTables.jl. But if you look at the manifest, the manifest contains a lot of different things, and all these different things are the dependencies of your table. So everything that you need, and all the packages that you, that are needed for geo tables to run, is listed in the manifest. Is listed in the manifest. Yeah. So that is an example of how you create an environment or an environment from scratch. So if you so basically. When you go back to this folder and you activate this environment, you can. Uh, this is ba so basically this is a completely new environment. This is a completely new environment that you have just created. Your first the first environment that you have created, uh, in, uh, and if you go if you go back to uh, if you if you go you must o and always remember you must always activate the environment first in this folder you must in order to modify the contents of the project.toml in this particular folder you must always activate the environment in this project first like um, 
and then you can do whatever you want with it. Like you can add your regions, or you can, or you you can add another package, for example, or if you want to remove, uh, or if or if you want to do other things with it, that's fine as well. Um, but also, no, but this is the environment for the for the project itself. If you want to go back to the master environment, which is the main Julia environment, uh, note that I note that you have just installed geo tables in this particular environment, right? But when you go back to the master environment, the old the old environment, the main environment, you will see that this is the list of my projects in the, this is the list of my packages in my main environment. I do not have, I do not have Joe tables installed because Joe tables is only relevant for that first environment that you have created, for example. So this is an example of how, this is, is, is an example of how you separate out how you can how you can separate out one project from another, for example. Um, this is also uh, why when we are talking about using Julia, we always encourage it is always encouraged to use. Uh, it is not encouraged to use the main Julia environment. It's always encouraged to use your own project environments that you have created yourself in order to run your own scripts. Yeah. So that's the up. Uh, that's uh, basically. Uh, how you create an environment. Is everybody following? Everybody's following? Yes. Uh, how, how did you uh, enter in the package mode? Uh, enter in the package mode is using this command. So basically, right square, right square bracket. So, so um, this, you, this is the normal one. You see Julia over here, like this, uh, you see this, uh, where my cursor is blinking, you have Julia and then the right arrow, right? Then you press the right square bracket, the right square bracket, press the right square bracket, you should automatically get V1.9, V1.10 or something like that. Everyone got that? Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. So that's, yeah. So that's how you enter the package. That's how you enter the package console. Every, uh, everything good? Yeah. All good? Yeah. And, um, did you follow, did you manage to follow the rest about the creating the environment? Yes, okay, good. So that's how you create an, that's how you create an environment from scratch. But what about if you want, if what about if someone wants to share their own project or their own package or their own, their own project with you, cause package you can just download from, you just, you can just install. It. If they want to share a project that they already have created uh, with you, um, okay, so, this is the one. So basically, um, uh, this is an example of how do you, how of of uh, pre-compiling an environment that's that uh, someone has shared with you. Um, so um, you can go to this uh, particular this this particular re repository if you want to go to this particular repository over here. Uh, I'll, I'll, I will, uh, I'm, let me, let me leave, leave, leave this link up first. Yes. Uh, okay. So let me leave, leave this link up for the next 30 seconds. So you guys can go to this particular link. Everyone good? Got to, the, got to the link? Everyone got to the link? Okay, so the next step that I want you guys to do is to clone the repository. Is to, is to clone the repository. Do you, know, do you guys know how to do that? You guys know how to clone the repository? Okay. So I'll give you guys uh, maybe 
another half a minute to clone the repository into wherever you want to clone the repository to. Everybody clone the repository already? Okay, so if you go into the repository, then you should be able to uh, go into Julia and activate, you should, go into Ju you should go into Julia and activate the environment. And then after that, if you click on status, you see that there's all these, uh, you, you should see that all this, and then you do pre-compile. All right, so that's how you that's so when you do that, that's how you that's how you pre compile that's how you compile an environment that someone has sent to you. Uh, I did status just to show you guys that I uh, just to show you guys the list of packages inside just list of packages inside this project, and then after that I did pre compile and then it compiled the environment, and then you see, and then after compiling the environment you see status and then if you look at status you should also be see be, you should also be seeing that there are some green arrows here and then there's a yellow arrow here as well, so the green arrow so the green arrows and the yellow arrow here mean that even though you have installed the packages for this particular environment, the green arrows mean that there are updates to the packages there are updates to the packages. Uh, to, to the packages that are in this particular project. It's just that the manifest, the manifest when you compile the many when you pre-compile, you're pre-compiling based on the manifest. So the manifest asked asks you to install these old versions instead. Uh, and that's why you have the green arrows because the green and the yellow arrows because these packages are updatable or there are new versions of these packages and the green ones represent packages where which are updatable. So if you update, if you update, you see that you see that you will ha you are going to update several of these packages over here. So you have several of these packages that after I press update, it will automatically go and find new versions of these packages, and then it's compiled. And then if you go back, git diff. So you see git diff. Uh, sorry. So, uh, oops, sorry. So basically, you see that git status. What I have done after I have updated my after I have updated the packages in my uh in my environment for this particular project is that I have modified the manifest inside this environment because I have even though I have even though nothing has changed in the project, the same packages are being used. The Ex the same or the same packages are being used, but the versions are different. And because the versions are different, you are modifying the manifest. So this is an example of this. This is an example of um, why when people some when when people or at least when especially when this is especially true when you are trying to reproduce results from uh, an old study, an old study maybe one or two years ago. If you want to exactly reproduce the results for the old study, sometimes it is best to just pre-compile and not update your environment because to pre-compile your environment, if you pre-compile the environment, you're using exactly the same versions of the packages that the original author was using to get the same results. So if you update 
you are using new package versions, you might not necessarily get the same result. So this is important to understand if you want to do, if you want reproducibility for project and for project purposes, for example. Yeah. So this is, this is uh, fiddling around with Julia environments. Uh, I think this is this is particularly necessary if you want if you want to uh, if you want to understand how not just creating projects but also creating packages because you have to you have to understand uh, how you in understanding the Julia environment and how pro how projects and how projects and uh, because for a pack the difference between a package and a project in general terms in Julia is that uh, in at least for my at least in my definition a package means that you have the project it means you have the project.toml but an actual project means you have the both the project.toml and the manifest.toml because what you want for a package is you want for for a package, you want it to be generalizable. You want people to use it for various different uh, use cases. So, because people different, because a lot of people will be using it for different use cases, they will be using it alongside many many other different packages. For example, so the so um, the so the exact dependencies of your package or the exact dependencies will change slightly for your package, but. Uh, because reproduce because reproduce because your package is supposed to be general is supposed to be general enough reproducibility is not is not so much of a uh, factor in this case whereas for a project in a project reproducibility especially if you want to share your results reproducibility is always necessary which is the difference so we are, so now let's get a bit more into the actual creation of packages so when you when you want to create packages, most of us when we create packages in Julia, we use this uh, we we use this uh, package called package templates .jl. So package template dot package templates .jl is uh, is basically a package a package used to create other packages basically. So it's basically a package that is base is ba this package is basically uh, meant to streamline the process of creating new packages. So when you use package templates, you can, you can, it will immediately set up the folder structure for you. It will set up uh, documentation. It, it will set up how you can do wow. documentation. It will set up the necessary Julia files for you. It will give you, a, it's basically a template, that, which is why it's called package templates. Um, so, and then what happens is that it will set up by default a package environment to create both the project and the manifest. Uh, by to create both the project and the manifest, but it will only track the project. So when you push your pro when you push your package to GitHub for registration, you will it will only push the project to the GitHub and not the manifest because for a package you do not want to push the manifest. Uh, to you do not want to push the manifest to GitHub because the goal of a package is not to be it's not to be specific but it is to be a general use for example yeah so okay so so yeah so the compact requirement or be, because base also basically because when you look at a package uh, when you look at a package for example this is the georegions.jl package here this is, if you look at the project.manifest, you will see that this is the name georegions. You see that there are dependencies as well. But when you want to register a package in Julia, your compat bounds or the, or the compatibility of your dependencies must be clearly specified. If you don't have this section, you will not be able to register your package in, uh, the, re in the Julia registry. So the compat is, is necessary is the compact is very necessary uh, is a necessary part of the project.toml which defines the versions of your depend of the dependency packages uh, that are necessary that are necessary for it to work to make your own package work so yeah this is the compact um, so you want flex and then you but the thing is because because you already have this compact you also basically want some 
and flexibility in your dependencies as well because your manifest.toml by nature, especially if you keep updating the manifest, it will if you keep updating your package or if you keep updating uh, if you keep updating your project, for example, it will your manifest will keep changing very, very, very rapidly. So that's why you generally do not also that's also generally why you do not want to commit your manifest because the manifest just changes too much. You only want to commit your project where your project will define the will define a range of uh, versions for which your dependencies can fall under. So for example, in this case, GeoRegions.jl depends on, uh, for example, Geometry Basics. But for Geometry Basics, I only want it to, I only allow uh, versions 0 0.3 and 0 0.4 uh, in the compact. So when I install GeoRegions.jl, it can only install either 0 0.3 or 0 0.4. It cannot install 0 0.1 or 0 0.2, for example. So that kind, so that kind of hard limit is also set in the project.toml. Um, that's why you generally, that's why generally a project.toml is enough when you want to, when you are creating a package or when, or enough to track. So this is about personal projects. I don't think this is, I don't think it's strictly necessary for now since we are about 15 minutes in. So, but it's just, it's just, I just wanted to show you that for personal projects, for example, uh, you want to track both the project and manifest because of reproducibility. For example, if you want to share your study with the rest of the world for publication, you want paper reproducibility. So that's just now I gave you an example of uh, downloading the manifest, compiling the environment using the manifest example. Yeah. So next, next one is why do we have different environments? So basically, um, so, so basically, that, so basically this, uh, the, now, the, now the question, now the question that I want to, uh, now the question that is being asked in this slide is why do we have different environments for different projects? Um, and that's also because we want, and that's because different projects may have different requirements and therefore may have different package requirements. So, um, for example, uh, okay, let's do this. Um, Oh, yeah. So this is uh, another activity uh, to this is another act activity to use uh, to show you the diff that different environments are independent of each other. For example, so if so, for example, if uh, okay, sorry, let's see. Um, um, Okay, and then after that we do this. We do this, um, and we do this. So we have two different, so we have two different, uh, so basically we have two different folders, test project new and test project old. If I go to test project old, and if I install the old version of NASA precipitation, and if I go to So basically, I installed an old version of NASA precipitation in this test project old project, and I installed a new one in this test project new here. And then you see that if I use NASA precipitation in the test project, uh, in the test project new, um, uh, there, are there are certain features, for example, for example, I can call this function called image dummy in the new version, but I cannot do it in the old version because the old version doesn't have this particular function, for example. So image dummy. 
See, so for example, in this one, I, in NASA precipitation, I installed version 0 0.1 here, in this one, I installed 0 0.1. I cannot call this function, but when I installed it, I installed the new version inside a separate, inside a separate uh, folder, inside a separate folder, um, I, can call, I can call it, for example. So the, the versions of, so the versions are, so when you are loading package, so when you're loading packages, it is important to first activate the correct environment that you are in. So if you're in a particular project folder, you want to activate that environment for that project first, uh, before, uh, loading, before loading your packages. Yeah. So that's, uh, just one thing about different environments. Yeah. Different environments. So you can compare and contrast NASA precipitation.jl. I'll leave you guys to do this on your own as an exercise. Uh, the, I, will, I will upload the slides. Uh, I will upload the slides to GitHub later. Um, so different environments means you can load two different versions of the same package. You can actually in, like you can install like and in the dot Jul, in the dot Julia. Uh, let's see. Uh, CD dot Julia. Uh, packages, yeah, NASA precipitation. Like you see in this in this case in this NASA precipitation. Um, so basically, this is so basically in this location. This is where the NASA precipitation packages are installed. You see that there are three different versions of NASA precipitation being installed because there are three because there are separate. There are several different environments on my computer and each of these environment and each of these environments uses a different ver and some of these environments use different versions of NASA precipitation. So because they use different versions of NASA precipitation, there are three different versions of NASA precipitation installed on my computer. But the version of NASA precipitation that you are using will depend on the project environment that you have activated, for example. So that's um that's about different environments. Uh, okay. So a uh, note that packages that you have already loaded will remain loaded as is. So if you have already loaded an old version of NASA precipitation, for example, um, if you have already loaded an old version of NASA precipitation, for example, over here, this is test project old, and then you want to do activate the, the test project new, and then you want to try using NASA precipitation. And then you try how much dummy? It doesn't work because you have already preloaded an old version of the package. You cannot overwrite, you cannot overwrite a package that you have already loaded with a newer version of the package. So if you want to load the newer version of the package, you have to exit and enter, you have to exit and enter uh, Julia again. See, and it works now. So you have to, you have to uh, go out. You have to exit Julia and enter Julia again if you want to. If if you want to, uh, what the hell? If you if you want to, uh, if if you if you want to load the correct version of a package that you have loaded wrongly, you have to exit and enter again. Yeah. So this is a warning. Uh, yeah. Packages you have already loaded will remain loaded as is. So five minutes break because it is, this is probably a lot. And I guess one, I just want you guys to settle down a bit first before we go on into the next, uh, next section again. Does anyone have any questions also, by the way, anyone not following anyone? Do everyone doing okay? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so Dr. Watson is, so Dr. Watson is, uh, basically meant to, is basically meant to create projects. So ba it's, it's basically the, so it's basically the project version of package template. So package template creates packages and Dr. Watson creates projects. And then Dr. Watson will create 
And when you create projects, it will also commit the manifest. And then depending on whether you want to commit the manifest or not, if it's not the final version of the project, then you can go and fiddle around with what is being committed and not being committed. But like, just that's just something to know. Yeah. Yes. The manifest. If I, if I create a, a, a package, a project using my, my system and creates a manifest, and if I have a Mac, mm -hmm. if someone tries to run my, my project on a Windows using the same manifest, does it break? Is it something like that? Um, it should work. It should work. The manifest is more. The manifest more is to specify the exact versions of your project that you are, or the exact versions of the packages that you are using. Um, packages are generally tested for Linux, Mac, and I also think for Windows as well. Quite often for Windows as well. Um, and the dependent, the dependency chain is the same. So, uh, that that's true. External binaries do play a role. I know NC data sets also had that problem as well. But like. The reason for me asking mm -hmm. is Mm -hmm. Some dependencies are compiled on, on my machine. So that's, that's why I ask. Mm -hmm. If they are compiled locally here and someone uses the, the manifest on another system, it might break something. It should, as long, it should, gen, it should generally work. Um, it should generally yeah, it should work almost all the time. Yeah, almost all the time it should work. Like, that's the thing. Yeah, if the pack if, if if something breaks during the compilation, that's more of an issue with the package itself and not so much the problem with the manifest. Yeah. Like it's it, like these are important things that people should know. That I spent, I personally spent like five months trying to figure out what the package environment was or how, like what exactly the package environment was being used for. So, and especially when it comes to like developing packages, it can be quite tricky. So, just things to. All right, any other questions? Any other questions? Okay. Um, okay, so uh, let's get to the next part, which is about create, which is about actually creating packages in Julia, finally, finally creating packages. So again, 
we are using, we are creating packages using package templates. So usually I use package templates to create and develop new packages. And package templates will automatically create and will create new packages and put them in the development folder in Julia. So for example, so for example, um, if you go into, so basically where's the development folder? The development folder is in the dot, is in your home directory in the dot Julia folder inside the dev. And you, and here you will see all the packages that you have, that, that you have committed or that you have uh, committed for development. So if you want to, so basically if you want, if you have a package, for example, uh, let's uh, install uh, geo tables for real this time. Uh, if you want to install, if you want to add geo tables, and then after that, uh, if you want to develop your, if you want to, for example, make some changes to geo tables uh, on your local computer, on your local computer, and then uh, makey compilation. Makey, 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 makey. Faster, faster, faster. Never mind. But if you if you if you want to develop a package, usually what happens is that when you press DEV, DEV of geo tables, for example, uh, or maybe DEV of another package, uh, it will automat Julia will automatically create a copy in the development folder. <sighs> it's taking a while to load, taking a while to compile, but that's make it for you. Um, Sorry, Simon. Mm. Compile, 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 compile. Okay, so I've, I already have uh, Joe tables installed. So let's dev Joe tables. And then you, if you go back to your dev folder, you see that in dev, you will have Joe tables as a package that you are developing. So pack, when package templates, uh, when you're creating new packages into, in, uh, using package templates, it will also automatically put whatever new packages you, whatever folders you are, or whatever folders you have into this particular folder so that, so all the packages that you are, all the packages that you are developing are in this particular folder. So for, uh, for, doc, for uh, bookkeeping purposes, yes, for bookkeeping purposes. Uh, let's, uh, so this is, so this is the development folder where all the packages you develop are stored and you can also develop pre-existing packages. So all you need to do is you need to do this, uh, you need to do the square bracket, then DEF, DEV, develop uh, whatever package name you want. So that's how you develop, that's how you put a pre-existing package into the development folder and now it's your turn. So try developing, so if you guys haven't, this is uh, you guys trying to develop your first package. So first, the first step, of course, is to uh, is to uh, let's go back to the main. Is to add package templates because package templates again is not package templates is not automatically installed on Julia. I already have it installed on my local machine, but uh, if you guys, but if you guys want to use package templates, you have to go and add package templates. So if you guys haven't done that already, you guys should do that Add package templates. Should then take too long. And then using package templates.
and the first thing you sh and then the first and then the thing that you should note is that uh, and then what you should note is that the package templates exports this function called template called template here and then what you want to do is you want to you want to do something equals to template so a equals to template for example uh, oh because it's the git the git problem uh, let's see this is the git problem I'm not sure if any of you guys also have this same problem that I have which is that I need to specify that the user that this that I so user net geo Wong let's try this again so I can do a equals to template da 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 a with template this this particular thing is a function this is a function so template whatever is a function a is whatever you're storing it in and then you do a my first uh my new package And then what package template does is that package templates will automatically uh, activate a new project in the development and will, actually, will automatically create a new folder in the development folder. A new, and then after that, will activate the project there. And then it will, uh, and then it will go. And then it will do all sorts of stuff in uh, your new pack in in the package called my new package. So now see here, if I do status for my main environment, uh, here, no, it's not here. Mm, it's not here. Okay. Never mind. But if you go to dot Julia dev, you should see that I have my new package in, in this uh, development folder. And this is where your new package, this is where you go to, to develop your new package. So if you go to VS code, um, let's just open that folder, the my new package folder. What do you have in this new package? So yes, I trust the authors. So in this pack, so what basically happens is that when you, when you use package template to install to or to develop a new package, package templates already has a set list of stuff that will automatically, that it will automatically put into this folder. Basically you have your project, you have a project or Tomel. You yes. Can you maybe show the command to create Oh, sorry. Okay, so what you have to do is you have to do a equals to template. This part here is because uh, I think somehow somehow from a computer you need and I needed to get. Your that's your GitHub username. Uh, like this is my GitHub username, but. Uh, but I don't know if you need this. I don't know if everybody needs this. Technically you shouldn't, but for my computer, somehow you, you need this. So I don't know why, but all you need to do is A equals to template. And I think you can just be an empty brackets. And then what you need after that is A bracket, my new package or bracket, whatever your package name, whatever you want your package name to be. So when you do A bracket, whatever you want your package name to be, it will create that package in the dev folder. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Everybody got to this step? Anyone who hasn't gotten to this step yet? The creation of a folder in the creation of a package yet? Anyone hasn't gotten to this step yet? Okay. So now we have this. So this is your, this is what is inside your new folder. I'm using VS code to show you guys. Okay. So, Basically, in the so basically, your it will commit um it will not commit it will create a project it will create a manifest uh it will then uh, it also have a readme and the readme is basically when you upload to the GitHub the readme is basically the front page and then the important part the part where you guys want to create functions to create stuff in lies in the folder called source inside my new package and then my new package in if your folder if your package name is my new package inside source the main julia folder is my new package.jl so uh if your package name is random package then in the source folder the the main file is random package.jl so in 
um, my new package.jl here is where you will write your functions here is where you will export your functions so that other people can use these functions here is where you will want to uh, say I am using a certain package so I'm for example using dates so dates like to specify a date and a time for example I will be using dates so um, this is an empty package so there is nothing inside here because you guys have to write whatever code or whatever functions you want in this package and then export it for it to be usable but um, now I want to show you guys an example using um, joeregions.jl I think I think that's the next one yeah so the thing is so now the question is what does a fully formed package look like so this is uh okay let me close this uh close 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 others close this okay so uh let's also close everything else everything else is not important okay so basically um this so basically joeregions.jl is I'm going to use georegions.jl as an example of a package that is more or less fully developed or more or less in the mature stage of development. So for ex so just now, for example, you had my new package. Inside here, you have module, my new package. You write your package code here, you have n. So module, georegions, you have everything. You have everything going on inside the main, and then you end. So for example, so everything that you want to do uh, everything that you want, every every functionality that you want to create for your package from A to Z must go within, must go within uh, the main, must be at least specified within the main, uh, let's close this, specified within the main Julia file, which is georegions.jl in this case. And you notice that in the source, I have other Julia folders, I have other Julia files, it's because they are all, included below here. So if I write functions in other files that I want to be called, I have to include the functions, I have to include the files in the main, uh, in the main georegions.jl file. So this is an example of what, uh, this is an example of what a fully formed package looks like. And don't worry, I'm going to go through everything uh, step by step. So this is uh, what, a package looks like oh, sorry um, okay so you so basically a package you will have your work your github workflow so a github workflow is basically like for testing uh, etc etc to ensure compatibility you have your documentation where if you write documentation for so that people can understand what your package is doing and then after that, you have your source, which is basically where you have all your Julia files and your Julia functions that you want to, that you will write. Uh, and then you will export those functions elsewhere. And then you have tests. I don't do tests, which is not a good thing. Like it's not a good thing. It's very bad practice, but I don't do tests because again, because I learned everything on my own. So I never learned how to do tests. So I've always avoided doing tests, but you should not avoid doing tests. I know I speak from, I know it's very bad. Uh, I'm, I'm setting a very bad example, but uh, you should learn how to use tests where you can. Uh, yeah, and then you have the project and the manifest and the readme, for example. So that's, uh, that's what a project looks like. That's what a project folder looks like. This is what, uh, so basically this is what, this is what, a module looks like so basically in a module you will use certain you will use packages your your dependencies so for example in georegions.jl i have all these dependencies i have dates delimited files ge geometry basics i will call all of them here in modules used so here you will see you so here you see that in the modules used, using XXX, which is basically using whatever fun whatever uh, pack dependencies that you have. So dates, delimiter files, everything here. Import is basically if you want to import a function. So in so in base, you have the function called show. If you want to if you want to re-export a function, uh, 
if you want to re-export show and read, you have to import it from base and then later you export it. But, and then this part here, export, export is where you will uh, list all the functions that you have previously defined to be exported. So for example, in georegions.jl, I am exporting this thing called georegion, region grid, abstract land C. I have defined these later on in the package, but in order for other people to use this functionality, I need to put, I need to export this functionality. No function. So if you want to use georegions, and then after that, you want to use the function in georegions called uh, reset georegions, for example. I must export the function reset georegions so that other people can use reset georegions. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So that's exporting the functions. And then you also define this thing called types. We'll, types uh, we will talk about types later, what types are exactly, and how you can use types in why types are important in package and uh, multiple dispatch. Uh, we'll talk about that later. And then after that, you, after that, you define, you include other files, you define your functions, and then you, you include other files in the module and other files with functions, for example, in the module. And then it will, uh, one thing to note, the order here, the order in which you do this does not really matter. So you can scramble your, so with one exception, but I'll give you the exception later. But in general, if all these are just functions, if all these uh, files just contain functions, you can scramble the fun you can scramble the order in which you include them anywhere. It doesn't have to be in sequential order, yes. Using, you mean inside a function, yeah, then you say you using. Say, for example, you, I construct the filter. You, in, you include your, your file that contains the function. Yes. And if in this file there is a using to load a certain mm -hmm. package, is a, a certain package is also loading. Mm -hmm. It, it should it should load. From my understanding, is that it should load, but best practice is always if it's in if you need something inside here, you should always put it out here as well. Just 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 you know like it's a it's a dependency thing. If every everything in your dependency should if you're using it, you should put it out here. Like just for like because because uh sometimes because a lot of when you get more familiar with Julia, quite often what you want to do is you want to go, when you want to get a first glance of what the pack, of what dependencies are needed in the package, especially when you're trying to fill around with uh, uh, clashing dependencies, what you usually want to do is you want to go to one file that will show you all the packages that are loaded in this particular, all the dependencies that are loaded in this particular package. So if all the dependencies, you have, you should put everything in your master file. You should put everything in the main uh, module file, which is in this case, georegions.jl because it's the package is called georegions. Okay, so that's what a fully formed package looks like. So I want to step back a bit from when talking about what a package looks like, and I want to ask people, like, the thing I want, I want to step more into a bit more into the philosophy. I have half an hour, should be enough. I have half an hour. So, uh, what people are trying to accomplish when you are designing a package. So, when you want to design a package, especially for Earth observations, what are you going to create a package for, for example? Like, does anyone want to? Uh, share what they would want to create a package for in of observation if you guys haven't created already. Like, yes. So I would say there's three main reasons for why I create packages. The first one, I want to create something, some kind of tool that. Show you some microphone. Um, some kind of tool that I really want others to be able to use as well. Mm -hmm. uh, most of them, they're rather small because I don't necessarily have the time to do that something really, really big. And to make sure that it also uh, is available to, um, yeah, uh, really well maintained for mm -hmm. others. Uh, but it's really something that I want others to use and most of the time that's something like rather independent that other people mm -hmm. can somehow integrate into their workflows. Uh, the second reason I think is, um, 
basically a documentation for myself. Mm -hmm. So that I, for example, say like, uh, I've worked on this uh, research project uh, and I basically throw all the scripts, all the notebooks uh, that I've written for it in there, sometimes even with mm -hmm. the figures, sometimes even with like including PDFs and so on. So that at some point later, I'm just like, oh yeah, I worked on this research project. I can go just go back to that. Mm -hmm. um, and either this is really just for myself and I don't bother about making it somehow like documented so well so that also others can immediately mm -hmm. use it or and this is the third reason i really try to um, create a package so that with like an instruction so that others know what i've done and how they can recreate that mm -hmm. so for example if you think about like some kind of simulation that you run and you may have uh, a certain setup in order to create an i don't know an ocean and atmosphere in the way you wanted to um, then you, for example, you could write it all in there and you could even like turn it into a little package and then say like using my fancy model setup. <laughs> uh, and then uh, you can basically have like a couple of commands and then you can recreate whatever that person did for that, for that project. So, so basically uh, for like workflows and ex for workflows and for documentation purposes, basically. Is that exactly. So it's like documentation, mostly for myself, documentation <coughs> for others as well. Also, like a tool that is and the, th the third mm -hmm. one, or that I mentioned first, uh, is is some kind of like tool that I really want others to be able mm -hmm. to, to 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 use on a like let's say frequent basis, mm -hmm. and not just in terms of like what have you done back then once. Yeah. Yes. Uh, sorry, uh, I would also say that uh, creating a package is useful when you have some kind of difficulty that you're working on. And then you have some idea to make something that is difficult, more easy for, for me to use and for others to use. And the package may, might be good for that. So uh, I might have an idea for a, a new way of downloading large data sets. Mm -hmm. And I create a package out of that to make it easy uh, with a, a, a simpler syntax or a simpler command. Mm -hmm. So people might download a, a, a difficult data set or something like that. Yes. Yeah. Oh, maybe I can start. Um, so I, I also sometimes create packages, and it, it's also to be able to like share the code I made and the tools I made with others so they can use it. And I think like before I knew how to make packages, what I would do was I would just send uh, files around and be like, I made this code, maybe you can use that. But uh, creating it as a package uh, also have the dependencies and it's easier to install, it's set up, you can do um, different versions so you can increment the version. So it, it really takes like sharing the code to, uh, to, uh, to another level mm -hmm. and, and make it really uh, the reuse much easier. Yeah, um, I mainly uh, make packages for myself. <laughs> which is, I guess, uh, not what uh, most of the people in here do. But um, I make them so it's easier for myself to use them for other projects because mm -hmm. a lot of my projects are building on top of each other. So like what you said, uh, had up there, you had um, one package you told us to install and you had two versions and you had other packages that use those versions. Mm -hmm. That is why I make packages for mm -hmm. myself. So I have one project and I make a package of it and then I have another project that is using that package. And mm -hmm. that's just easier if it's a package. Okay, so all, all, all good answers. Um, most of what I probably am focusing on is more documentation of personal projects is also important, especially when it comes to complicated like models and, and so on and so forth like models. But more of what I was thinking of uh, was on streamlining of workflows, like the downloading of data sets, for example, data retrieval, data analysis, plotting and visualization of data, for example, when we are doing so basically, uh, like from online servers, data repositories, for example, NASA precipitation, the package that I use is basically data retrieval and a bit of data analysis. And then, um, so, there are diff so the thing about when we're talking about creating packages for Earth observation is that, um, like all these, all these, when you're creating packages in Earth observation, most of the time what we're doing, especially we're talking about streamlining workflows is because there are actions that you will perform on the data set. So the thing, the, the reason why I'm talking about this is because um, 
I find that when we are creating packages, sometimes de like depending on how we go about it, sometimes people create packages. Uh, sometimes when people create packages, they it's it's a bit haphazard that we always try to make packages. Uh, we try to make packages that can do everything, and sometimes I feel that that is good. But sometimes there's also value in keeping things relatively specific or relative so we can define so in my in my case i when i usually create a package i'm just sharing my philosophy like you don't guys don't have to follow it but uh this is what i do when i usually define a package i usually first focus on defining the data sets that i want to you want to uh tackle with this package and then there are components this is also more related like to observations so like observations, satellite observations, analysis data sets, for example. So it talks about how would I organize a package? So usually when I design a package, this is like more for the people who are just starting out designing a package. Uh, like a lot of us, some, some of us here in this room already have experience in designing packages the way we want to design packages or have designed packages or have a lot of experience in designing packages. Like a lot of people, people will come up with their own methods to design packages in a streamlined and in a, in a, in a streamlined and effective way. But for me, the way I design a package is I usually, when I design a package, I usually think about three things. I want to talk about what the package is supposed to, what, pack, what the package is supposed to do, or uh, how the package is supposed to handle like the file system, how it's supposed to handle where it puts all the data that I've downloaded or that I have retrieved. I'm thinking about the different components. So in Earth observations, not you don't, you don't just have the data set that you're looking at, you have the variables in the data set that you're looking at, and you also have Quite often, because it's Earth observation, you're looking at a specific region. You're also interested in the specific geographic region, uh, in a pack, uh, a specific geographic uh, region of interest. Like these are components that you. These are component. In my opinion, these are component parts of the package. And what we're doing when we're doing downloading and analysis and calculation and plotting and all these things, these are actions that we are performing on the components of these pack of a package. So for example, when, uh, I, when I did, uh, when I create a package for reanalysis, ERA5 reanalysis, for example, I, let's see, let's, let's just look at the example here, right here. So when I did, I have. I have a lot of different folders and the fo and the reason why I have all these different folders is because they all serve different purposes. For example, um, I have some things like the file system and the land C that is a general part of the package. And then after that, I also have like data set. I have variables. I have a variable and I region. These are the comp these I consider to be the package components or the things that I need to specify in order to retrieve the data that I want or to or the things that I need to specify in order to retrieve or download or analyze the data that I want. And then the green parts, which is basically like analysis or downloading or from conversion from hour to day, for example, these are all actionables. These are all actionable things. And then of course you have the miscellaneous back end stuff as well. Like that's my general philosophy when I uh, create a package, for example. So this generally means that when at least uh as, and i'm especially talking to people who are just newly starting out using julia when you want to design a package you need to think very carefully about what the what data is available and what data is provided for the data set that you are interested in. that you need to be you need to be able to go in and explore the data set first before you decide to create a pack or, or, and be comfortable with exploring the data set before you go in and design a pack, just go in and design a package. So, you, so before you go, before, for example, if you want to retrieve something that's like, for example, uh, Sentinel data, for example, uh, if you want to retrieve Sentinel data, first you need to know where to retrieve the Sentinel data. You need to know, uh, 
how to retrieve the sentinel data like what log because when you treat sentinel data oft, often there's like login and stuff you need to be able to under you need to know like the address for example what the patterns of the address are because usually when you save data when they save large data sets there's a certain pattern in which they save the data sets and then what the package is going to do for you and uh you may not want to retrieve everything that is available so for example when i'm talking about so when i'm doing nasa precipitation right i am retrieving precipitation data there is also a lot of other information that is available in the global precipitation mission which uh, is the overarching mission for the precipitation data so for example here you see you here you see that uh that's good let's zoom in a bit so you see so you so when for example when you down when you download uh a hdf or uh when you download a data set for a single timestamp for a single timestamp from gpm you will find that there's a lot of extra there's a lot of extra information for example there is infrared there's infrared radar precipitation there is ca uncalibrated precipitation for example or this is like the details not necessarily important but what i want to say is that when i was doing nasa precipitation i was only interested in total precipitation I knew I was only interested in total precipitation. So when I wrote my package, I did not write my package to include all these other, all these other uh, variables that most people don't use. Most people don't take into account, not, not they don't take into account, but most people just don't use these data sets unless they are, unless they are, unless they have a specific, unless they are in a very specific view. For example, most people are more interested in total precipitation in the longitude and in the latitude. So when you go in into a data, when you go into a server and you retrieve a data set, you need to know what exactly you are retrieving and what and how, uh, what exactly you are retrieving basically. So do you, so the thing is, and then, so the thing is, do you need all the extra data that is provided here or do you only need just a few things? Because again, you are only, quite often when you're developing these packages, you are only one person and your time is limited. So you need to do what is most cost effective to you, uh, what is most co cost effective to you and to the community at large, for example. So if the community at large only generally uses precipitation data and not the other fields that they provide, you don't, you, don't necessarily need to think about uh you don't necessarily need to think about the other variables that are included in this data set for example so uh and then also you have that packages can also handle multiple data sets for example so for example there are many so example gpm provides when they provide total precipitation, they don't just provide total precipitation on half hourly. They also provide it for daily. They also provide it for monthly, which is all specified here. Sometimes, and then sometimes you do want your precipitate your package to be able to handle multiple data sets at once. Not not at once, but they, you want them to be you want it to be able to handle multiple data sets that are provided, multiple data sets that are similar. That are provided so each of these but the thing is each of these data sets for example when you download half hourly precipitation versus when you download monthly precipitation the file convention is different in half hourly precipitation compared to monthly precipitation for example so the data sets have different properties they each also probably have different performable actions for example if you want to download half hourly data you can convert half hourly into hourly data or three hourly data, but you cannot convert daily or monthly data into hourly or three hourly data, for example. So certain data sets, so all these data sets have sim will have use will have actions that are that you can perform on all of them and some of them have actions that are specific only to e some or each of them so in a single package how do we handle multiple data sets is using types plus multiple dispatch so when so uh just so this morning when when Iga was talking about uh using types or using structs for example this is what we this is what we mean by uh, type so basically 
a strut here is basically is basically kind of like an object. It's basically like an object that is 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 basically kind of like an uh, types are basically like objects. For example, so if you have a certain object and you know that an object is of this type, then you therefore perform. Therefore, when you say I download this particular, I'm trying to download this particular object type. I can when I don't the the serve the uh, using by specifying uh, a data set as a type as a struct type. You can then say you can then say that uh, when you when you call a function for a specific type. Like using a specific type, that function will perform a specific action. Uh, sorry, I'm not explaining this extremely well, but um, it's called uh, but it's called multiple dispatch. So, for example, in uh, geo regions, for example, uh, let's do this. Uh, for geo regions, for example, there are two different types of regions. One is a rectangular region, and one is a poly region. So just now there was a rec region strike. So I have two different function. I have um, two different functions here. I have they are the same name. So region. So there's a region grid function, but there are two different methods for this region grid function. One is based on the rect region type, and the other is based on the poly region type. So, we when you have an object type, when you have a specific object type, you can uh, specify, uh, you can specify for a, for functions with this, you can specify a fu that a function has two different methods, one for each type. Does that make sense? Does that kind of make sense? What I'm trying to say? Yeah. So if I have um. So just now, um, okay. So just now, down here, you had a rec region and you had a poly region, and they were subsets of the geo region subtype. So if so, bec because they, you have a rec region and a poly region subtype, you can have two different methods using. You can specify two different methods for a function with the same name. Yeah. So that's how you can handle multiple data sets in a package. You specify that a data set is a type. So it's a type of data set. And then using multiple dispatch, you can you can say download and then download basically because this is it is of this type. You have specified that you have uh, created a data set of this type. Then you can download the data set of this type with a specific uh, and then it will call a specific method to download the data set of this type. Does that make sense? Yeah, so basically, for example, in NASA precipitation, I there's iMerge data sets and then there's Trim data sets and iMerge data sets has half hourly, daily, and monthly, and Trim has three hourly, daily, and monthly as well. And then when you do the downloading, for example, then when you do downloading, you can download every half hour. You can download the half hourly data sets or the daily data sets or the monthly data sets for example but you can still use the same you can still use the same uh, function name so it's just download da 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 yeah so uh, that's one of the benefits of using Julia for example uh, multiple dispatch I'm not sure if Python has an equivalent but this is one of the reasons why I like using Julia so I can specify everything with a simple function name and then I can extend the methods of that function name um, uh, with using using types that I have defined in the package itself because all these types that I am talking about here for example this abstract type here abstract geo region you must define it in the package itself so you define it in the package and you define the subtypes in the package itself uh, and then that's how, that's how you uh, that that's how that's how you extend the methods, and that's how you, uh, that's basically one of the that's basically one of the reasons, or not one of the reasons, but like when you're doing a package, one of my main recommendations is to use types like that. So if for example, if you have SAR data, for example, and you have different types of SAR data, you might want to use different types for different types of SAR data. Yeah, pun. Okay, but um, okay. So that that's that multiple data sets in the package, and I was going through. I wanted to go through like why. Uh, I want. I want. I just wanted to go through the thought process, or at least explain the thought process of uh, 
creating a new package on creating new packages in Julia. Yeah. So the next thing about um, next thing about package creation is that you are when you design a package, you are the one that understands the package best, but not everybody understands the package. Like if you go, if you ask someone to dig into your code to understand the package, it's not really going to work. Um, so a good Julia package, not only is comprehensive and well-organized, but also must be easy to understand for different people, which uh, brings me to documentation. So documentation, so package templates will set up documentation, will set up the skeleton for the, of the documentation for you. But uh, if you want to know how to use documentation, you should go to uh, documenter. You should go to documenter.jl here. This, uh, this is a, another Julia package for documentation. Um, it will basically set up a documentation for you. So basically this is the documentation for my package. Uh, so let's go to, so basically, uh, do I have it? Yeah. So basically, uh, when you can create doc, when you create a package, you also sound like a good, good practice is to create documentation. So when you create documentation, for example, this is the documentation for my Joe regions package. Uh, I have tutorial what, on what are Geo, what Geo regions are, how do you use Geo regions, for example, like this is like this kind of document, like this kind of documentation is also necessary for a good package, for example, especially if you want your package to be widely used or you want other people to be able to use your package easily. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's documentation. Okay, so TRDR. Package templates is a good tool. I showed you, uh, you, you guys already had, I guys, I, I already made you, I already made you guys do a short example or a short activity on how to create a package using package templates. And then designing a package requires familiarity with the different data sets and the variables in the data sets. Uh, so if you want to design a package, I recommend sketching out what your package is supposed to, like, I recommend that you guys do a, or recommend that you guys do a sketch of what you want your package to do first before you actually start coding up your package. Because uh, speaking from experience, especially from Geo regions, uh, it's not it's not uh, super straightforward. Especially when you're starting out. When you're starting out, there are a lot of uh, best practices that you don't necessarily know. Um, so. What I recommend sketching out what the data sets and the variables are in your package. What is the same de between different data sets and different variables? What is different for different data sets and different variables? Uh, multiple data sets can also be handled in Julia using types and multiple dispatch. And documentation is also necessary. And I have another break, five minutes. Does anyone have any questions on what I've presented so far? Any thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, so a bit of <clears throat> give people a bit of a break for like one or for like one or two minutes just to come out of it because it's it's a lot. Yeah. Um, yes. It's just a quick. Uh, it's just a quick comment that like in Julia packages, the documentation is often part of the package the source code. So it, it's just something that's that's edited in the, in the same folder. And uh, also, if you add doc strings to the functions, you can you can include that automatically, and it also shows up all the right places when people need it. And uh, then uh, I think you click really really fast on the documentation tag mm -hmm. on yeah. the GitHub folder. That's a really really useful uh, resource for a lot of Julia packages. When you find the Git GitHub folder, there's the small doc documentation tag, and if you click on that. Most of the time, it opens uh, some documentation. Yeah, I'll be going through some. I'll be going through uh, regions.jl as a package, so uh, I will go through a bit more documentation later as well on what doc strings actually are and how you put doc strings in the Julia folder, Julia file as well. Yeah. Okay, so um, I think we won't have time to cover everything because. Uh, I only have what twenty more minutes. Twenty more minutes. So um, I will just go through twenty four, twenty five. But 
Uh, I don't think people want to stay much past four anyway because we have uh, a reception upstairs later. So um, uh, I'll just go through this. I'll, I have I technically have a fourth part. This is the third part. Uh, this is the third part, uh, which is uh, I'm just you're going to be using GeoRegions.jl as an example of a package. Like I've introduced several different concepts before. Now I want to bring them. Now I want to show you how I use them in GeoRegions.jl, for example. Um, and then the fourth part, which is on mm. how do you use GeoRegions.jl. Um, I'll, that that one I'll upload it and then you can look at the Pluto notebooks etc cetera, etc cetera, and go through uh, or you can look at the documentation yeah you can look at the documentation uh, but I just wanted to get I just wanted I, I don't want to necessarily rush through this third part here so the third part is on creating packages in Julia using creating packages in Julia and using GeoRegions as an example of a package that I've created for example so basically GeoRegions.jl deals with a bit of background, GeoRegions.jl basically deals with gridded data. So you specify an ID and a name for a geographic area and you specify the boundaries or the shape of that region using using the different coordinates. Uh, and then you can, and then with that, that, that particular shape or that particular region along longitude latitude is what I consider a geographic region or a geo region for short. So it's so I the reason why I created this package is specifically because I wanted to be able to specify regions to download data. So if I, for example, wanted to download NASA precipitation data only for a specific region, then I would use geo regions to specify that region for downloading because the NASA precipitation data set is huge. It is 0 0.1 degrees by 0 0.1 degrees, which is 3600 by 1800. And then you have, it's every half hour and it's 20 years worth of data. And that is terabytes worth of data. And you don't necessarily want, unless you guys, unless you have the storage space and the internet bandwidth, you do not want to download, download terabytes of data. This, which is why, when I use when I downloaded when I created GeoRegions.jl is to help me specify small regions so that I can download them faster. Yeah, so like I said, uh, using learning how to use GeoRegions probably I don't have time for that today because I'm running over time. But um, this section is focused on using GeoRegions as an example of how to organize and structure a Julia package based on what I've was talking about before. So you can talk about, you can go back later and compare again some of the concepts that I mentioned just now with regards to types and methods and met multiple dispatch and to show you guys the thought process between, uh, the thought process for GeoRegions.jl because currently GeoRegions.jl is um, version five. And then one year ago, it was version three. And then the thing is, why did I bump it up two versions? Um, so basically, uh, the upshot is because Julia vo follows semantic versioning. So if you publish any of your packages as version one, if you create breaking changes, and by breaking changes, what I mean by breaking changes is that if your code no longer works when you update your version, that is a breaking change. So if the so if I did download something 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 for version one and then the next version was down I did the same thing download and it broke because I changed the method, uh, or I changed the keyword arguments for example the arguments of the input, um, that is considered a breaking change. Yeah. So if you so where so one thing that I would advise is that when you're creating a package you do not try to rush to push towards version one. You can keep it as version 0 point whatever for uh, an infinite length of time. For example, uh, Maki, for example, I think is still version 0 point what, 2.6? Uh, yeah, 0 point, it's version 0 point 20 or something like that. So like, uh, and then Ocean Anigans, which is the, yeah, zero point is is version zero point six eighty or something like that. So, you do there is no yes and yes. 
Yeah. Yeah, but when you create that, ver but the thing is, when you create the version in the project version, you, in the project of Tomo, you can just modify it versions back to version zero point one. Yeah. Yeah, you like because especially since you you generally want to you generally want to try out your package with the wider community, but you don't want to commit to a version one. So you usually go to version 0 0.1 or something like that. And then you can keep it a version 0. Point something for the rest of your life if you want. Uh, no one's going to no one's going to force you to push to version one. Uh, I personally think I pushed push to version one a bit too fast and that's why it's not a version five. I don't know, but it is what it is. So, um, uh, if you so basically, let if you want to explore uh, georegions.jl as an example. So basically, the so basically when we're talking about package component and actions, there are many different there. So this part here, the file, there's no real file system handling for the package, so that's not completely relevant, but I wanted to elaborate more on the components of georegions.jl and the actions that I performed using georegions.jl and what I classify as components and as actions. So, for example, uh, components, for example, a georegion is a component. A geographic region is a component. And then from a geographic region, you have a region grid, so from lo a longitude, latitude grid, and a geo region, you can come up with, uh, you can come up with a region grid for that specific geo region, and then there's also uh, a land abstract landsea, which is a landsea data type, mm -hmm. and then all, and then and then the thing about all these components is that if you look in georegions.jl, if you look at the source code for georegions.jl, you will see that all these. You will see that uh, geo region, region grid, and abstract land C. These are all um, these are all abstract types. So, for example, abstract type geo region is an abstract type. Uh, region grid is an abstract type, and then uh, abstract land C is a is a is an abstract type as well. So, all my co like when I'm talking about components, a lot of the time I'm talking about uh, when talking, uh, especially for when in georegions.jl, I'm more or less talking about uh, abstract types as well. So, for example, if you look at some of my other, if you look at some of my other uh, packages, like for ERA five reanalysis, for example, you will find that the ERA five dataset is an abstract type. The ERA five variable is an abstract type. The ERA five region is an abstract type. And then all those are components of my ERA five package, for example, and then that, and then there's also actions that I can perform on all these. So, for example, I can use, uh, I can use uh, the geo region extract type to say is point X in point Y, and then, or region grid to do data extraction, for example, or I, or I can use the land C data set to download etopo topographic data, for example. So uh, again, the master file of package name is always found in source package name .jl. So this is the starting point of every package. And again, this, for example, in June regions uh, the package is the package uh, the master file is in source uh, regions .jl. And then uh, I do want to people to note the order of what I am doing inside the source of georegion.jl. So in the source of georegion.jl, what I did first is that, uh, okay, it's not here, it's here. Is that I loaded the package dependencies first here. I loaded the package dependencies. And then I exported the pack, and then after that I exported the package types, uh, package functions and the types. So you can export functions and types as well. Uh, and then after I defined the types, for example, down here, all the way below, I defined the types. And then after that, I defined the functions. So 
the one exception to the ordering of your functions, etc., etc., is that you must always define your types before your functions. If you don't define your types before your functions, your package will throw an error because, uh, especially this is especially true when your functions are using types that you have defined in your package. If you, for example, I used uh, I used abstract land C for example here. I used abstract land C inside here, for example. But if I included land C this file on top first before I defined what the abstract land C was, the package would throw an error. So you must always define your abstract types first, or your types or the relevant types first before you use them before you use them in functions. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the thing, but the one thing that you can shift around is the export. So you can shift around this part uh, from here, or you can shift it all the way to the end as well. It doesn't really make much of a difference. And also, uh, but besides the fact, the fact that you cannot define functions before types, you can shift, you can, again, you can shift around everything you can shift around uh, all the different, uh, the order of the files that you have included here. So the file, the, the order of the functions in which you, the order in which you define your functions doesn't matter. The only thing is that the types must come before the functions. Yeah. Um, yeah. So loading package dependencies um, is, so you, so using the, when you're using something, using a package, it's using the, the term using is okay for most cases, but when you want to re-export a function, uh, you need to use uh, import base. So, um, so if, for example, I'm defining, if I, not, not re-export a function, sorry. If you want to define a new method that if you want to define a new method for a function that already exists, so for example, in base, uh, base is always loaded. So show and read are functions that are always loaded in your package when you're using Julia. If I want to define a new method for show and for read, I need to use import. So import is when you want to define a new method. You cannot use using. Um, if you want to export the package functions and types, um, the order, the order of which you export doesn't matter. I usually put the types first because of for bookkeeping purposes, and then I export the functions. So the first section here is types, and then the second section here is uh, functions. Uh, and also exporting types is important if you want to create a parent package that relies on dual regions. So, so for example. Um, in NASA precipitation.jl, I use geo region types. So because I use geo region types in NASA precipitation, I must export the geo region uh, type from the package so that other packages can use it. So let's uh, so let's give an example. Um, so in era five reanalysis here, I use. Uh, you will you will find that in a lot of uh, let's see, you I will I use um era I use uh, let's see, sorry. So for example, to create a era five function, I need to use a geo region. I need to specify what the geo region is. So because I'm using a geo region, the geo region type, I must uh, I must uh, export the geo region type. Uh, from georegions.jl. It's the same as exporting a function, basically. So if you want to use a type in the parent function, you need to export it in your, uh, in your sub function as well. So, um, yeah. So exporting types is important. Um, and the type must be defined before it can be used in the function. So for example, in, so for example, in the master file, I defined um, extract type geo region first, and then only after that I could use the rec region and poly region types. Uh, the next one is that to define your functions, the order of the functions don't matter, but I need to remind you again that the types must be defined first. Um, so for example, um, 
Uh, so for example, when you're talking about the order of the function, doesn't matter. So this function, so for example, the poly region function, there's a function, there's a function called poly region and there's a type called poly region, but the function for poly region was uh, called first, but was only defined later in the package, for example. So the order in which you define your functions doesn't matter. The package automatically knows that it's a, the package automatically knows, uh, will automatically be able to tell, uh, will automatically be able to cross-reference different functions in different files, regardless of the order. Yeah. So that's Joe regions and ex as an example of a Julia package. Um, the thing about, the thing about why I want to talk about all this is because I learned all these practices by trial and error. So I committed to version one a bit too early. So, uh, for example, version one to version two, for example, uh, version one was really ba was really basic. It was just basically I was just basically using strings. I was basically using strings to define, or I was just basically using strings uh, and not types. So it became very hard to probably. It became very hard. To, well, it's it not hard, but it became very messy. the The package became very messy until I ch until I shifted to using types to redefine all my to redefine all the methods and all the functions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that was like version one to version two, and that was the so in version two because I had types, I could store and save information by the geo, about the geo region without having to keep calling functions over and over and over again. So in version one, for example, if I wanted to know the uh, name of the geo region, I would have a function name called geo region name. But now all I need to do is I would just load the geo region. I would just define the geo region to be to the geo region. And then after that, uh, I will have the geo region geo dot name. I'll just keep calling geo dot name instead of having to call the function to read the files over and over and over again to find out what the information was. Because the information, because now I'm using types is already saved in an object that I have called in Julia because I'm using types right now. Um, and then the reason why I uh, broke uh, the reason why it jumped several different version packages is because I kept changing field names, the names of the struct fields. So for example, when we look back and we see, uh, where is it? Uh, here. So here we see that in, in, in uh, type, you have the fields. So ID, PID, name, all these are fields. This, this is what I call fields. Um, what I did is that from version three to version four and version four to version five, the field names started changing. So because the field names started changing, uh, the field names changed a lot. Um, it, it was a breaking change for several different, it was a breaking change for several different packages, breaking change basically. So I had to bump up the versions again. So basically in the sense that when you're talking, when we're talking about field names, we, a lot of the times we're talking, about, we're, we're talking about uh, making packages easy for people to use. We want them. We want the, for example, the field names to be as intuitive as possible. So, for example, the ID of something. If you have a field that is the ID of a geo region, for example, the identification, you just call it ID. Like the first, in my first iteration, I call it R. Uh, REG ID, which is like region ID, but I found that it was a bit too, it was not intuitive, for example. So when you create, when you create packages, for example, a lot of the times when you're doing these kind of things, I just want to remind people that simpler is always better. Things that are more intuitive are always better. Um, that kind of, I, I just want like, these are things that you need to take note of when we when you are designing a package, especially when you're designing a package for public use, because um, because because it can be it can be quite, it can be quite uh, we we can get a bit carried away. I feel like or at least I get carried away, but and also because I know the package best, but that doesn't mean that other people know the package as in depth as I do. So a lot, a lot of these things you need to cons you need to. I'm just trying to remind people that you need to consider these things when we are creating Julia packages. Yeah, and then, um, okay, now we're talking about this part. We're talking about doc strings. So what exact, so just now there was mention of documentation and doc strings. So what exactly is a doc string? A doc string is basically something, in Julia, a doc string is basically, 
a, um, a documentation string that you put on top of the function itself. So you, that's, that's how, uh, that's how when you do documentation, documenter.jl, which is the package, documenter will automatically translate all these strings into your documentation online. So um, for example, the doc string here, uh, let's zoom in. This is the doc string here, at your regions for at your regions here. With this doc string here, it automatically translates in docu documenter.jl will automatically trans translate this doc string into into something into into a HTML format like this online over here. So um, when you're doing when you're doing uh, when you're creating a package, um, it is always generally it is always generally advisable to put doc strings on top of your functions, uh, so that when you do documentation, it comes out. It, come, it comes out uh, from one to one, basically. So this is an example of a doc string and documentation in Julia and how, how we do documentation in Julia when we're doing, when we are creating function, we are creating functions and packages at the same time. And then um, you can export functions uh, for use in other packages. So for example, georegions.jl exports the Lancy type. So Lancy flat type, so here is the Lancy flat. And then in uh, and then NASA precipitation, NASA. This is the module for NASA precipitation. When you're doing, uh, it uses georegions. It uses this type. So it NASA precipitation has a Lancy type that is a subset of uh, Lancy flat, which is basically from the georegions package. So that's how. So when you export, so basically using uh, when you. This is example of how you can export a type that is later used uh, in a in a package in a parent package. So basically, for with georegions.jl as a dependency of NASA precipitation.jl, georegions.jl exports a type that is used by NASA precipitation NASA precipitation.jl, for example. Yeah. So okay. So that's how that's how you do it and. Um, we are at 4.10 and I do not have time to uh, talk about, uh, show you guys how to use georegions.jl, um, but I hope that you guys at least learn something or at least read some things were learned during this two hour, this long two hour lecture. But yeah, uh, thanks for bearing with me and I will stop here for today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any questions, comments, anything? Yes. So, in the breaking chain, if you do not document. Concerning the field names mm -hmm. and the breaking change that you mentioned, so if you do not document the field names, then the, the name of the fields are just internal, so you can change them uh, mm -hmm. without, uh, without needing to. Uh, to uh, uh, to declare as a breaking change. And yes, another and thing- Because those field names are often used in other scripts, for example. So those scripts are, so for example, when I updated georegions from version three to version four, and then from version four to version five, I needed to go and change a lot of my other uh, packages as well because of that breaking change. This is why I thought it was a breaking change. Yeah, yeah, was, yeah. For you, it was breaking. So yeah, it was probably mm -hmm. <laughs> the breaking change. So, and so um, a way to, uh, to access the, the data in a struct is often making with, uh, with simple functions. Mm -hmm. So then you can support uh, the old name and the new name mm -hmm. at the same time. So that's a way to, to ma maintain the API. Another re really nice thing in Julia is that you have the get property function that you can overload. Mm -hmm. So um, even if you change the name of a field, you can still have it accessible using the old name by overloading uh, get uh, property. So that's also a way to uh, to uh, to maintain the old names and mm -hmm. this, uh, the new names at the same time. So, thank you. Yeah. Uh, my question is about the, the, your package that downloads the data. Do mm -hmm. do you save it in a particular place on the disk that you can retrieve it later? or on the current directory? So it depends on the data set. For Joe regions, because I'm downloading Etopo data, I 
either can I either just load it on the spot so I don't actually save the data, but it's in the memory. It's in the it's in the Julia memory. So it's so it's it's something that I every time I open the script, the script will just download again. The script will just open and retrieve the data from online, but it won't actually save anywhere on the computer. But you can also specify, but for me, I sometimes, I have the option to either specify to either save or not to save. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's an option for, for it to do that. there are other pa packages that do different, that save it on the cache, you download once and then you save it. And when you save it, you have to save it in particular places. And I was curious about an organization if you had that that option. I mean, yeah. that the organization, I, I feel like, um, how do I say it? Like georegions.jl <laughs> is meant to help with that organization in the sense that it's meant to, it's like the, you can use the ID, for example, to specify, to help specify a file path or a folder path. But all in all, when you create a package, you, when I, I, my philosophy is that everybody has their own way of, everybody has their own way of saving data. So um, there's no real, there's no real fixed way to do it in, uh, there's no real standardized way across Julia, for example. I do it in a certain way for my packages. Uh, you can do it in a certain way for your packages as well. Does that make sense? I'm not sure if that's answering I have question. another question, but this is a slightly different thing. It's about Windows and the and NetCDF. I have a follow-up on your first one, yeah. so maybe... Maybe, yeah, that's it. Uh, are you saying that, oh, because you're using Windows? Uh, no, that, no, that's no, different. No, no, that's, that's a different that's question. question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nathan, just, just a follow-up and a comment. Uh, there are packages that have good practices on how to download and cache. Mm -hmm. DataDepths.jl is one of them. And there's also Artifacts.jl where you ask to download the first time, and the package will do all the work to check if the data is already on your disk when you call again the same function. Mm -hmm. So you can check datadepths.jl and artifacts.jl. They have this purpose of, okay, there's a data set. If you download the first time, and you place it somewhere mm -hmm. where Julia knows how to download later and then how to load it back later. Mm -hmm. And then it, the next time you call the same function, it will look in that directory. It's a standardized, like, don't dot .config folder somewhere. And then it's going to just load from disk. And you have options to configure that as well. Mm -hmm. So two packages I, I, that I'll I would say. Talk, I'll probably need to talk with you about that later. Does that mean? No, let, let, let's chat. There are two mm -hmm. ones. I think there are many more, like datadepths.jl and artifacts.jl. Mm -hmm. I think these are two ones that I have out of my head. Mm -hmm. Probably using some of this as well, like disk arrays or something. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But my other question was about your curiosity. If you download a NetCDF file, you don't, yeah, the file is big, and you only want to download a little bit, how do you do that? I'm, well, I'm giving off, off the answer. On Linux, Gdal is able to download a subset, but this is with a trick for Linux. That trick does not work for neither Windows nor Mac. So my curiosity, if you download, you have a big NetCDF file, if you don't want to download it all, that's more common than the opposite. How do you manage to download just the bit that you are interested on? I have been lucky so far. Most of the stuff that I download is from the OpenDAP servers. OpenDAP is able, Open you are able to specify exactly, yeah. you are able to specify exactly what indices you want what, in, what are the range of indices you want your data from? So using georegions.jl, what I usually do is I usually am able to come up with the indices of those regions and then specify those exact indices that I want to download. I don't, I'm not too sure if it's possible to do it for any data set outside the open dark servers, but someone might have a trick for that. Yeah, does that make sense? Yes. I was more or less guessing that you were going to open up, which I, yeah. I know for many years, but not using. Yeah. But open, but using open up works on works on Mac as well, at the very least. I think it should also work on Windows. Yes, yes, yes. There's another way uh, in, in NetCDF library with HTTP ranges. So this does not require open up server, but it's uh, 
it does not uh, work for any dimension. So it depends how the data is stored on the disk. Anyway, I'm cool. So we can talk about that yeah. more. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm done.